So I'm so excited to be back and with you guys, even though really all I see is a green dot, but I'm here with you somehow. Today, we're gonna to talk about IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. It's a diagnosis given to so many people. So many people are affected by it. And what does it really mean? And if you're listening here and you're just like, do I have IBS? Maybe I have IBS or I already know I have IBS. This episode is for you. People with IBS are constantly in pain. They're constantly in search of a bathroom. They're constantly uncomfortable. Their clothes are tight on them because they have bloating. And the worst part is that they're given this diagnosis of IBS and they're also told, well, there's really nothing I could do for you. It's conventional medicine kind of throws them into this diagnosis of IBS and there's not much of a cure, which we're going to, of course, dismantle today. So if you have IBS, if you know someone has IBS, or if you have belly symptoms and you think you might have IBS, you're in the right place. So before we dig in, we're going to talk about what IBS is, how to fix it, and why it's so important. Like, who cares if you have IBS? I care, and you should care also, and I'll tell you all about it. Um, so before I go in, let me just tell you how to reach me, depending on what platform you're watching. So if you're watching us on Facebook, drop the word live, let us know you're here, because it really makes our day when we see that our friends are listening. If you're watching us on replay, click, uh, type in the word replay, because it lets us know that you're watching it too. Makes us feel great, because I am talking in an empty room and hoping that somebody's listening. So it's nice to hear. No matter where you are, type the word change and I'll let my team know that you want our show notes because sometimes it's nice to see things written out. And of course, if you are watching this on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you're listening to me on the podcast, oh my God, I'm not wearing my wife's stethoscope. She's going to kill me. But on the podcast, of course, my hair looks amazing. I'm wearing a blue sweatshirt and a red and blue shirt, checkered shirt. But I forgot my wife's stethoscope. I'm sorry, Gigi. I love you but they can't see it on the podcast. Anyway, no matter where you are, don't forget to follow us on Instagram because we're hella funny and it's just a good place to reach us and uh, private message us if you want to. If this topic speaks to you, um, share this with other people in your life that maybe it could help them because it's all about helping as many people as possible and let them become the game changers in their life. And if you don't know me, my name is Afrat Lamandre. Everyone calls me Dr. E and I invented the new method where we empower people to finally realize that their symptoms are not in their head because you always knew there was a better way. So let's jump in, join the conversation wherever you are. Let us know that you're here. Also, if you are watching me live, ask a question. This is a great place for your questions, even if it's not related to IBS. For my game changers, if you're watching me, just ask any question you want. This is a great place. We will answer it. So IBS, what is it? What is this all about? So. If you have stomach pain, cramps, diarrhea, constipation, bloating, the first thing you have to do is see your GI. I say this every time. This is always one of my first paragraphs. Whatever you're dealing with, you must go to conventional medicine first. So if it's a stomach issue, you go to your GI. Let them do the testing. Do not diagnose yourself. Do not just convince yourself you have IBS. Do the colonoscopy. Do the endoscopy do the H pylori test, whatever test they're recommending, make sure you get it done. Their job is to make sure that they, that you don't have anything. And when they don't find anything, that's good news. Don't get too frustrated because that means you don't have some of the biggies. It means you don't have polyps and you don't have Crohn's or you don't have cancer. That's good news. Don't get frustrated, but go there first. And then when they can't find anything, they will diagnose you with IBS. And that's when you come to me. But let me just tell you what the diagnosis, what the criteria is for IBS so that you know what it means. Technically, this is the criteria. It's belly pain and discomfort averaging at least one day a week in the last three months. It also has to occur with at least two of the following, pain and discomfort related to going to the bathroom, defecation, change in the frequency of defecation or change in stool consistency. So it's at least once a day in the last three months, but also associated with some pain and discomfort when you're pooping, a change in how often you are pooping and, and the change of consistency if it's hard or soft. I know it's kind of gross, but someone's got to talk about it. Let me tell you what it's not. If you have one of these 
It's not IBS. Stop diagnosing yourself and run to your GI. Okay. If there's any type of gastrointestinal bleeding, go to the GI. If you have iron deficiency anemia, you got to see your GI. If you have unintentional weight loss, or if you feel a mass in your belly, I know it's kind of obvious, but I want to say it, you have to run to your GI. Or if there's a family history of colon cancer and you haven't gotten screened yet. So any of those red flags, it's not IBS. Okay. But anything else, if you've done all the testing and they call it IBS, awesome. You're in the right place. And a lot of my patients will come in initially with a sense of relief, like, great, I've had all the stomach pain and I finally have a diagnosis. It sounds very fancy, irritable bowel syndrome, I have a diagnosis and it kind of feels empowering. But then if you hang tight long enough, you realize it's not really a diagnosis. It's just a lack of any other diagnosis. And so you're just called IBS. So you have the symptoms and now you have a name for it, but what do you actually do? Let's unpack the name a little bit, IBS, what it actually is. So IBS, first of all, it's a syndrome, irritable bowel syndrome, which means we have a collection of symptoms that are just bundled into a syndrome and because we don't know what to do with it. So we're gonna take bloating and cramping and constipation and diarrhea and all of it. When we don't have an answer for it, we're just gonna put it and call it a syndrome. Sounds pretty fancy. And then we're going to say that this syndrome is for people whose bowels are irritable. You have an irritable bowel and you have some symptoms and that's going to be the syndrome. But that's not the whole answer. What do you mean I have an irritable bowel? Isn't the answer in finding out what is irritating the bowel? Wouldn't we want to know that? Yeah, of course. We want to know what's irritating the bowel that's giving me these symptoms because IBS doesn't tell you anything. So I'm going to give you some simple steps. And then, of course, we're going to dig a little deeper. Simple steps of how you could start figuring out what you do to determine what's irritating your bowels. Okay. The very first thing you have to do is a food diary. Let me bring, bring it up here. You have to do a food diary. And I know it's a little annoying and I'm not saying forever and you don't have to share your thoughts and secrets, just a food diary for about two weeks because a lot of people don't realize what is triggering them, right? It's clear that if you have a greasy hamburger and a whole bunch of French fries and a milkshake, that your bowel is going to be irritated. That's a no brainer. But a lot of you are saying to yourself, I eat healthy. Why is this happening to me? Because there's something in your world of healthy foods that is still triggering your bowels. And if you don't do a diary, you'll never figure it out. So, and for some people, it's going to be something that they really, really love and some, something that in their mind, they really think is healthy. They can't imagine that it's causing them their pain. And so writing the diary, so you're going to, ideally, you're going to write down every single thing that you eat. No judgment. We're not counting calories. We're not showing this to anyone. Don't panic. You can burn it when you're done. So you're going to write down what you eat. And then you're going to write down when you had the symptoms, when you went to the bathroom, when you had the bloating. And you will be amazed when you find out the patterns. And again, I'm, I want to remind you, it could be something healthy. It could be you know, you're eating a salad and it has red peppers in it because Dr. E told you to eat the rainbow and eat as many things of as many colors. So you went out and you got red peppers and you're thinking you're super healthy. And it turns out that red peppers are irritating you until you start writing it. You won't even be able to grasp that it's something so healthy that can be doing it. So the diary really helps getting it together and trying to figure out what food or category of food could be causing it. For some people, the category of food could be diet food. A lot of the diet foods have these sugar alcohols in it. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And those sugar alcohols will destroy your gut. So you're out here eating a, you know, a diet snack bar or a diet drink, thinking you're doing the right thing and not understanding why you have IBS. So the food diary is critical. Now, some of you might say, I, I, everything on the food diary is irritating me. What do I do now? <laughs> What do I do now? So there are special tests out there. I'm going to talk about those, but don't run to those tests. Even in my book, I talk about the fact, don't run for the testing first. The tests are there 
And by the way, those tests are not food allergy testing. Food allergy testing is something called IgE. That's something that creates a histamine response. You can go to an allergist for that. That's not what we're talking about. These are food sensitivities for IgG. They're not covered by insurance. They're super expensive. I do use them sometimes. I use them with patients where we're really hitting a wall. But generally speaking, it's not where we need to go. What we start with is an elimination diet. You want a completely clean slate to see how you're feeling when you're not eating anything triggering. So in my practice, we use something called the Renew Diet. Basically, we remove all grains. This is temporary. Nobody panic. Don't faint on me now. All grains, all sugar, all dairy, all legumes, most of the fruits except for berry, and we remove starch, starchy vegetables. And we start there. And if your symptoms completely go away while you're on this elimination diet, then you're in good shape. That means there is something in your world prior that was causing your irritable bowel syndrome. And then we have a method where we reintroduce each category one by one to see if any comes come back. And then you can figure out your own, like what you can and can't eat. It's amazing. It works perfectly. And it's the cheapest way to get to where you want to go. And you also feel amazing doing it. So we want to talk about, again, you can do the testing if you want to, but at the end of the day, a food diary and elimination diet is where you want to start. But those are the quick and easy way. Now we're going to get a little deeper because there are going to be some of you who are like, okay, I've tried both and you know, it's still not there. So what's actually going on? What's actually at the core of IBS? At the core of irritable bowel syndrome is something called a microbiome. And if you don't know what a microbiome is yet, you're obviously not a fan. You haven't been watching my episodes and you need to get on it because I talk about it every week. So microbiome is basically an entire world living inside your belly full of bacteria, good bacteria, bad bacteria, and they have to be the right amount of bacteria and they have to be in harmony. Not too much good, not too much bad. Everything has to be perfect. So this whole world that lives inside of you, this microbiome is essential to how we survive. It's in charge, it balances our sugar, it balances our hormones, it balances our neurotransmitter. It is the center of the world for us. And when it's not balanced, it's going to cause havoc and that havoc could look like IBS. Let's talk about one of the most common symptoms of IBS, which is bloating, food baby. Yeah, anybody have that? You name your baby? Do you name your baby? Tell me if you do. Can you just tell me if you name it? I'm just gonna look in the chat real quick and tell me if anyone's naming their baby. Okay. Oh, oh someone says to keep a food lock. Okay, cool. If you name your baby, put it down here because it's really awesome. Okay, so <laughs> I used to name my baby all the time, but I don't have food babies anymore. Anyway, I digress. So what is food baby. Um, food baby, which is such a common symptom of IBS, happens when your GI is full of air or gas, right? It feels tight. It feels painful. You can't close your, your pants. It's really uncomfortable. Here's the thing. Bloating and gas is actually not produced by you. It is completely produced by the bacteria that live inside of you. So if you have gas, bloating, distension, food baby, whatever you want to call it, all of that is the bacteria in your belly having a feast, having a party, and you're not invited. It's your body's reaction to the food that's causing. That's why elimination diet initially works because you're removing the offending agents and that, you know, so that your microbiome isn't so agitated. But like I said earlier, some people will say, I've removed everything and I still get bloated. Why is that happening? And then you have to consider something called SIBO, which stands for small intestinal bowel overgrowth. And that's basic. Remember I said, you're supposed to have good bacteria, bad bacteria, and they're supposed to be like all in line. If you have too much bacteria, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth too much. Now, when you eat your food and the bacteria starts to consume it, it just produces gas. And that's going to produce bloating no matter what you eat. You're going to be one of those people who are like, it really doesn't, I'm eating air and ice and I'm still bloated. Um, and that happens. So consider SIBO as diagnosis. You diagnose it with a breath test, 
you basically drink a liquid that the bacteria loves to eat, and then you breathe into a bag and it's tested for hydrogen or methane because that's the gas that the bacteria produce. And if it's positive, you have SIBO. And in this particular case, the primary way to manage it is antibiotics. If you are suffering this much and you have SIBO, you will need antibiotics because you're going to want to balance this good and bad bacteria. But the point is you can be someone who is diagnosed with IBS, who has this constant bloating, when in fact, what we're dealing with is a microbiome issue. It's not an irritable bowel syndrome. It's a microbiome issue. Now, speaking of antibiotics, yes, there are times we need it, like in SIBO, but there's more times when we don't need it. The overuse of antibiotics in this country is out of control and will cause the symptoms of IBS. So if you're one of those people who every time you have like a sniffle for one day and you're like, let me go to the urgent care, let me go to my primary because I want antibiotics to nip it in the bud, stop it. Just, just, just stop it. Don't do that because first of all, it's not helping your cold at all because your cold is a virus, so stop it. You're not nipping it in the bud, stop that too. And what you're doing is causing havoc to your microbiome. So you think you're doing something through your cold, which you're not, but you are destroying your belly. So if SIBO is having too much bacteria, people who keep taking antibiotics are destroying the good bacteria inside their belly. And then they're going to be like, I don't know why I have IBS. I don't know why everything I eat makes me sensitive. It's because you've destroyed the bacteria inside your belly. So super important. Don't take antibiotics when you don't need it because they go in and they just kill everything in its path, um, including the good bacteria, some fungus, some yeast, things that we really need in there. So get rid of that. While we're on the topic of things not to take, please don't take antacid drugs or acid blocking drugs. It totally messes with your microbiome. Why? It's an anti-acid, which means it brings your pH down in your belly. You bring the pH down in the belly, certain bacteria can't survive and other bacteria thrive. You've changed the environment in this ecosystem with this antacid and then brand new bacteria are going to come up and the ones that you need are going to calm down. So you're out here thinking, well, I have reflux, no big deal. I'll take an antacid. Great. Your reflux is gone, but so is a whole bunch of bacteria you need and you've just created a, a breeding ground for bad bacteria. So now you're stuck, right? Because you have reflux. So you took the antacid. Now you gave yourself IBS. Now everything you eat bothers you. Now you need more antacids and you're stuck in this loop. And I beg you, get out of it. What you want to do is get rid of the things that's caused you reflux to begin with. Get rid of the junk food so that you don't need the antacids because you're going to be stuck in a crazy loop. And it's super hard to get out of that one. Lactose intolerance, I want to talk about that for a second because that's in the spectrum of IBS, okay? Lactose intolerance, this is how it works. When you eat lactose, when you eat dairy and you have lactose, right, then you have an enzyme called lactase. Lactase eats the lactose, all is good with the world, the sugar goes in your system, everything is fine. But for some of us, we don't have enough lactase. And that means we eat some dairy and the lactase doesn't consume it. So the dairy, the lactose goes into the large intestine, unconsumed, undigested, and the, the bacteria in the large intestine are like, oh yeah, time for a party. And you already know all the symptoms that accompany that. It's a mess. Now, lactose intolerance is on a spectrum. So some people, they can't have any bit of dairy because they don't have lactase. So they have a little bit and they're off to the bathroom. And some people are like, well, I can have a little bit of milk in my coffee, but I can't really eat a cheesecake. Or yesterday I was fine with ice cream, but today for some reason, the milkshake really bothered me. Because when you're on the spectrum of lactose intolerance, you can have a little bit of lactase that gets you going for a little bit of milk. But as soon as you have more, it sets you off. So it could be confusing because why some days better than others. But the answer is because you can only tolerate so much. But the reason I bring this up here is because, again, this could be classified as IBS. Oh, you're just a little sensitive to dairy sometimes. It's not IBS. It's a microbiome issue. It's, your, it's the fact that your lactose is going in and being digested by the bacteria in the large intestine, causing havoc. Understanding your microbiome is going to give you the understanding you need for this IBS. 
super important. Another thing that operates the same way that we eat a lot is sugar alcohols. So xylitol, mannitol, sorbitol, the things that make your diet food sweet, they pretty much do the same thing to your body that I just described with lactose. When you eat regular sugar, and I'm not saying we should eat it, but when you eat regular sugar, it gets absorbed in the small intestine and processed and everything is fine. When you have these sugar-free sweeteners, they don't get digested in the small bowel. They go to the large intestine and then again, bacteria have a great party with them and you'll have gas and diarrhea and bloating and all that fun stuff. And again, it's a spectrum. Sometimes you can have a little bit, but when you eat too much, it sends you into the stratosphere. So understanding all these things that I'm saying is understanding that, yeah, IBS is just a collection of symptoms. It's not really a diagnosis. What we need to do is understand what are the offending agents that are causing our bowel to be irritable and what's happening in a microbiome. What is it that we need to repair? Because if we understand those two things, then we understand how to fix IBS. IBS, if you really want to understand it, is understanding how to repair your microbiome. And before I tell you how to repair it, I need to answer this question. What's the big deal? So I have IBS, so I'm bloated a little bit. Like, who cares, lady? Like, why are you even spending a whole episode on it? Like, big deal. It's a big deal. It just shows you haven't been paying attention to any of my last episodes, and shame on you. Just kidding, no shame game, but go back and listen. Um, it's a big deal because inflammation doesn't stop at the belly. We're so used to like separating our body parts, right? The GI is in charge of belly and the derm is in start of skin and the kidney doc is in start in charge of the kidneys and like none of it is connected. Yeah, it's, it's all connected and we forget that because everything's so specialized. But if your belly is irritated, your whole system will be irritated, which means if you have eczema, psoriasis, a skin issue, it'll flare up. If you have joint pain, any type of autoimmune issues, it will flare up. If you are prone to brain fog, your brain fog will get worse. So fixing your belly is it also going to fix your system. It is all connected. So it's super important that we fix the belly for whatever else you're dealing with in your system. You have to fix it. So now the question is, great, now I know IBS is a microbiome issue. Now I know why it's important because if I don't fix it, I'm going to feel like ish. But now the question is, how do we treat it? So we treat it with obviously elimination is big. You have to do the elimination diet. You have to get rid of the offending agent, but then we have to repair the belly and repairing the belly. The order of the supplements is really important because a lot of you will just be like, Hey, let me just grab some probiotics and we're good. No. In fact, people who start probiotics too early are going to be messy. What do you mean? E? You just told me I need, I need, you know, bacteria because of a microbiome, but no too early. And you're just giving yourself more bacteria can create havoc. So elimination first, and then we want to repair and we repair that with collagen, short chain fatty acids, digestive enzymes, and we go slow based on your tolerance. Some people can tolerate them all at once. Some people need to go one week at a time with each, each person's different. And then when you feel repaired and you don't have as many flare ups and you figure out what your triggers are and all is right with the world, that's when you add the probiotics to help things along, to help continue that balance. So I know it was a lot, it's a little bit longer than usual, but I'm hoping you understand now that IBS just tells you, you have nothing else to worry about, but we don't know what to do and that's okay. Always go to the GI first, but recognize that we're talking about as a microbiome, we have to fix that microbiome with elimination and supplements. And of course, if this gets, this gets confusing and you want to work with us, you can reach us at the new method on just about every platform, except of course, Twitter. I said every week because I talk too much for Twitter. I can't do it. Um, and you can private message us anywhere, or you can go to the new method.com and book a consult, whatever works for you works for us but we just want you to start feeling better and become the game changer in your life because you always knew there was a better way. I'll see you guys next week.